Hello, everybody. I can see the participants trickling in. So welcome on in to our webinar today, How to Build a Win-Win Sales Culture in 2023. Um, we're so glad to have you all join us. And while people are still coming in, I would love to introduce who we have here today. So uh, myself, I'll go first. I'm Mary Foster. I'm the VP of Demand Generation at Ambition. So that for us, what that means is all things pipeline generation. So that's inbound marketing, that's sales development outbound. It's kind of the full scope. Um, I've been at Ambition for four years and uh, live in Nashville. Would love for y'all to put in the chat where you're from. Uh, if there's any other Nashvillians, find you in there. Um, and I'm excited to introduce Shay and Jen from um, Lavender and Outreach. And so Jen, if you would tell us a little bit about yourself, um, give an intro. Yeah. First of all, it's great to be here. I was first exposed to Ambition, as, as some of you know, last year, and I'm your mega fan. So when you reached out, I was like, yes, 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 yes. Um, so I have been a weird lifelong seller. 18 years I spent selling at Corporate Executive Board, Gartner, and Challenger, which some of you may know from the Challenger sale book. Um, I recently, as in this is day three, started at Lavender, which is basically an AI email assistant that helps you write emails not write them for you, but helps you avoid making common mistakes. So I have switched to the dark side of marketing. I can't believe I'm saying it, but here I am. Um, so that, that's, I've got a lot of history in sales and three days of marketing. So that's who I am. I love it. And what about you, Shay? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So um, my name is Shay Keeler. I um, lead our uh, new logo SMB team at Outreach um, globally. So I've got people in Seattle, London, um, all across the board. And what that role entails really is um, all of our new business going anywhere from 35 employee count up to 500. Um, and I actually started out as an AE at Outreach. Um, I took the wild step from being a, a leader at a previous company and wanted to get into SaaS. And so I started out as an AE, kind of bet on myself, um, and then have worked my way up here. So I'm in Seattle uh, in the rain and um, yeah, excited to be here today. Yeah. What a great, um, great group. So um 2022 now behind us, it feels both like a lifetime and like five seconds ago. And it was a big year of learning in the sense that we saw unprecedented layoffs in SaaS and tech. Um, and I think we also saw a lot of changes from like a technology standpoint, everything from like at the end of the year, you know, in the marketing space chat GPT coming to fruition, like keeping everyone on their toes. Dark social was a big theme throughout. Um, it was a year of learning. And I think 2023 is going to be a year of evolving. So from a culture standpoint, uh, standpoint, you know, in the workplace, it's kind of like, um, whatever you learned, you might be able to build off of it. You also in evolve, you might also just be learning new things. I don't think anyone is really prepared um, to know, but 2022, what does the data say? We ran some surveys throughout the year of our audience and 40% of revenue teams experienced layoffs, internal restructures and hiring freezes. And I'm curious from both of y'all in your seats, if you saw that in your orgs, or if that seems to align with kind of what your audiences would say as well. Jay, kick us off. Yeah, I would say um, I experienced it a lot with who we're selling into. So we sell into sales teams. Um, and so every day it was some, you know, something new of layoffs or freezing in that regard. Um, I didn't experience it in my own team, um, luckily and fortunately, uh, but I definitely experienced it in the market that we're selling into um, and had lots of people impacted by that. Yeah, I think sales was hit really hard. Um, obviously tech space, obviously SaaS, but I think sales departments really felt it um, a lot. And this probably won't be surprising either, but 72% of revenue leaders said that they struggled to hit goals or effectively manage and retain reps. I think we saw some people dig heels in on remote. Some people were pushing the back <laughs> to office thing. Um, so as much as we got comfortable with like hybrid workplace, um, it very quickly that changed. And it was kind of like, do we do that? Um, but 
I'm sure this stat resonates with probably Jen, the work you did at Challenger. I'm sure you worked with a lot of orgs who would say this is probably true. Yeah. I mean, I think we all go into sales knowing there's going to be these high highs and low lows, but like 2022 was on a whole nother level, right? I think, you know, we were, we came off of Q1 for many of us, we had this really high, high, like at Challenger, it was the best quarter, first quarter we had in our entire time as a company. And just the stark difference from Q1 to Q2. I mean, there was a week in Q2 where I lost $2 million of deals that were late stage. And I just think, you know, we all go through that as sellers, you, you get these surprises and these things, but years like last year and what we're stepping into, it, it's like, it's a whole nother layer for managers and coaches to have to be mindful of the emotional toll. I think it's taking on sellers, not just the toll it's taking on the business. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, and you know, I think if people start doing soul searching when this is the kind of like numbers they have of like, is this right for me? Am I in the right seat? Am I on the right bus? Like what, what is that? <laughs> Where's this bus going? Um, <laughs> you're probably like, I thought I was really good at sales. And then <laughs> you start to, start to question it. Um, so that's what the data says, but it's kind of like, what do your people say? And you, you can't really measure people. It's sort of like what we talked about, like soul searching. Um, you go through this, what, you know, some people call it the culture curve or employee change curve, but and people go through it at different cycles, but you may start the year up here with a full pipeline and energy and hope, and, and <laughs> um, you may go that way on the curve. So I'm curious if y'all have seen this model before, or if this is how you think of humans that you lead, um, or just kind of any anything that stands out to you about this. I can jump in. So I would say I draw this for about every new AE at some point that I have worked with. Um, because I think we all experience it. I, I think of sales as like a roller coaster. When you're on the top, you know, you're going to come down, but you don't know how hard or how fast you're going to come down. It's just going to happen. Um, and so it's kind of like that, right? Like when you get into a new relationship, it's really exciting. It's really great at the beginning and you know, you're going to hit these rocky points. Um, Personally, I have a lot of people that I've promoted from SDR orgs um, and then bring them in as first time AEs. And, you know, an SDR, it's a pretty, it's by no means an easy job, but it's a very rinse and repeatable process. And if you get really good at it, you can kind of master it. Well, as an AE, uh, like Jen talked about earlier, like it's something's new every day. And you got to figure out like how to negotiate. This person said we could do it. Now the CFO said no, which is happening so much now. So I would say this is um, applicable to anyone at any time. Um, and you really just never know which way on the curve you're going to go. Yeah. How do you even begin to assess where you think someone is, or do you show it to them and be like, where are you on the curve this week? <laughs> I think like typically what I'll do is I'll draw it and I'll talk about, and I'll like be like, Hey, like, so this is typically what happens in any big life event or any time we're going through challenges. And then they'll start to, I don't normally put the words or the things on it. I let them kind of tell me where they're at. Um, and then we come up with a plan of what it can look like. And a lot of times I think it's just helpful to know, like, Hey, this is, this is normal. How you feel like I've, you're not the only one that's ever felt like this. You're not the last person who's going to feel like this. And so, um, you know, you're not in, you're in this together with someone else as well. Yeah. And I think this is helpful maybe specifically for revenue leaders to see, because typically, or at least in my experience in the past, it was really about managing to the numbers, right? It was managing the deals, the forecast, the pipeline, and you didn't have the, um, emotional weight that I feel like we have now. And culture was, um, not something that ever really came up that much. It wasn't important uh, in a sense because the joke was always, you know, salespeople wanted to just get paid or that's, you know, um, money driven. But in times like this, I think it becomes super important and and not all reven revenue leaders have a ton of experience in it. And so, um, uh, you know, here's a kind of a view of how revenue leaders could help facilitate conversation around it. And it does start with, listening, which it sounds trite, but it is like, Hey, we can't just listen to calls. Uh, we can't just listen to you know, your deal breakdowns, or it's kind of listening to where the person is at on the curve, um, educate, evangelize and coach. And I think last year we talked about the year of the coach. I had heard about coaching more than ever. Um, and I think part of that is because the numbers get harder to hit. And then part of that is because, more of this type of leadership is required in a revenue role. So I don't know if that was different for either of y'all in your seats of having to be 
um, coaching more on the human side um, in addition to the number side, but that stood out to me a lot. Yeah. I mean, I think it held true last year and as someone who is on day three of their new job, like that last slide you showed that that entire left side is my exact (laughs) emotional state. Right. And it's like, I was someone who was with especially the same company for 18 years. And it, it is wild to me how much you can start to doubt yourself, your capabilities, even if you are like, you earned a promotion, you get into that new role and you're doing it in a market like this, Mary, to your point. And it's just like, that self-doubt creeps up. And, and I think about, I think about it a lot as it relates to human behavior. Like if I have a problem or if I'm feeling really insecure about something and I go to a friend and they just shove advice down my throat, I'm like, that's not what I'm here for. Right. So I love the way that this lays out. Oftentimes you just want to be heard and understood. And that is so very different than like managing the mechanics of a business. Like that's such a rigid, like feelingless motion. And so I, I empathize with managers who have had to lead across the past year. And then this year forward, because it's a whole other layer of complexity added to their job. Yeah. And I think that helps take the pressure off some of the managers as well to understand that you don't have to have a solution all the time. Part of the role is listening and validating, or, um, you know, just acknowledging that you're kind of in it together. Um, because that was definitely it. When I was a first time leader, I remember feeling like I always needed to have the answer or the solution, or I was failing at the role. Yeah. And I think it's important to note that on the here, it doesn't say solve it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> if you can, that's great, but you can't always do that. <laughs> That'd be pretty sick. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I, um, I do want to kind of look forward here of some common things that people stand out to say have caused, you know, big culture changes. So it's everything from misaligned values, uh, business transformation, um, you know, uh, growth or globalization, new leadership. I think everyone's probably heard at some point that phrase of like forming, storming, norming. Uh, every time you add someone to the team, it's a new team. Or every time someone leaves, it's a new team. And it's kind of like, yo, we added and removed a lot of people last year as a collective industry. So I think everyone is going through it um, and probably experienced many things mergers, acquisitions kind of that would cause a big culture shift. Um, So now we want to talk about how to build a winning culture. I think everyone on the call today realizes the importance of it. They've probably all been impacted by some of those big triggers or catalysts. And so when we talk about values, first and foremost, ambition, what we do here, we have a charter. Uh, We go through an exercise to actually declare the values. I think a lot of people do that, but then there's also um, getting into actually executing that or living the values. And um, I'd like to kind of just open it up to talk about how you might define and align everyone in an org or your team to similar values. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I took over the uh, my team last year. I, no one was in this role, and so I took it over. And the, one of the things that I think the best leaders that I've ever worked for have like a vision and have people bought into this with values that align to the vision so that you're kind of all working towards this one goal. Um, and so that's something that I think is also really important to not just get tell them what the values are. So like, hey, here's here's the values that I think are great for the team, but enrolling them them, getting their feedback, getting their thoughts. And like, sometimes I think it's constantly evolving. Like I had, we had to make some changes to some of ours because what, what Q1 looked like at the beginning of the year looked different by the middle. And so I think it's constantly evolving and making changes to those too. Yeah. I think that's a great one, like one example of someone like evolving or living values. Like we actually had, I had an interaction with someone. It was uh, you know, kind of a terse interaction. I got an email back. that was like, Hey, so sorry. One of our company values is don't be an asshole. And I'm <laughs> be an asshole. So like sometimes it's as explicit as something like that. And sometimes it is a little bit harder. Like, you know, um, I'd be curious in anybody to put them in the chat, but, um, you know, one of ours is bias toward action. And so, sometimes it's like, what does that mean? I do want to bias towards action, but I also want to like honor a process. There's now more process than ever or whatever. So I think it can be tough, um, but it is important to declare it, to bring it up often. 
a vision, mission, value statement, things like that. Um, you know, that's, I think just helps to get through tough times when revenue is being missed. Like, Hey, can we default back to our values? Can we default back to some of these things and get creative? So, um, another thing on here, um, is talking about growth and a growth mindset. I think people talk about that a lot, but how can you prepare your organization, culture, team for something like um, M&A? Because that happens a lot in economic times like this, or new leadership is very prevalent and kind of how do you address that from uh, not damaging your culture or building a stronger, better culture? Yeah, we were laughing when we were preparing for this because I was like, this is literally a checklist of like all the things I went through in my career that I was like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that to be that hard. Um, so just to set the stage, when I started at CEB in 04, it was like a mid-sized company. We got acquired by Gartner, which was a large enterprise. Then we spun off and were owned, our business unit was owned by private equity. And it was essentially a startup with an established brand, which is kind of odd. And now I'm at Lavender, which is a true startup, right? So as I look across all these different types of organizations, I don't think I had an appreciation for the pros and cons and the differences going into it, right? I, especially when I was earlier in my career, I'm like, oh, cool. This is a bigger company. We'll make more money and we'll have all these like additional resources. But I didn't appreciate things like when you are part of a larger organization, sometimes some of those like amazing, amazing values of your smaller company, like meritocracy shift. Sometimes your ability to have an input on product and, you know, roadmap for the strategy for the company shift. And all of a sudden, like one of the things I found myself in was I went from having a voice to being kind of a cog in the wheel and I was completely unprepared for it. And I don't knock my manager because my manager was going through the same thing. They had never worked in an organization like that as well. So that's why when I think about some of these, these changes, I think it's so important to make absolutely zero assumptions, first of all, about people will just naturally know because I'm the CEO and I've been through this, what it's going to look and feel like and how that's going to be different. Um, and two, make sure you're not doing it top down, right? There is some level of top down communication, but who we were joking about this, Mary, like who gets on one of these town halls and is like, uh, I have this really stupid question that I'm going to embarrass myself in front of all of my new coworkers <laughs> with. Like you have to create these safe spaces where people can either anonymously submit or they can say like, you're connecting people together to say here, let's like treat you like adults here are things you are probably concerned about and here are things you aren't concerned about, but should be. And we want to make sure that you feel like you can have an open conversation about those things. So you're not sitting there in the background thinking about quitting or leaving or whatever the case may be because you're unsure. Um, so when we think about like m a when you think about companies that are going through rapid growth, when you think about, Hey, we're establishing an EMEA presence and we're just going to assume those guys will get all the same communications we do. Like these are all, I think the big word I keep coming back to is we make all of these assumptions that people will just get it and figure it out. And I, I go back and forth between like, we need to treat people like adults, have hard conversations, but you also need to make it so accessible for them to understand exactly how is this going to look and feel differently. So when it happens to them, they're not completely caught off guard and don't know what to do. So there ends the sermon. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And I think something that you, you know, touched on too, a lot of people can be feeling a lot of fear in situations like this. And um, to your point, no one's going to just raise their hand and be like, I'm scared. I'm not going to have a job uh, in a minute. And, you know, or I'm scared that um, this merger means, you know, is that we're all, all of my people I care about are out of a job or something like that. And um, speaking of globalization, Shay, I know you have experience there. So I'm, I'm curious kind of your thoughts here. Yeah. So, um, I'll, I'll give uh, what the situation I ran into this summer is I, um, took over our EMEA team. Um, they had never reported into me. I was like, I knew them all, but I didn't like personally know them. Um, and it was an underperforming team. Like they worked really hard, but they were underperforming. And so, Something I always, I believe that as a sales leader, you're kind of a therapist, um, which is probably why every sales leader goes to therapy because they're then uh, learn how to do it back to their people. But, you know, the first thing I, I came in and did, and I 
made sure of is that I was like really transparent. We got on the same level and they understood that I cared about them as people. And so like, it was a change they were having, you know, I think to um, Jen's point earlier is like a lot of times people assume things, but like, I had no idea that they had to wait 48 hours to get this answer. That was like so simple and we needed to like give it to them quicker. Um, and so we just really created this like line of communication and, and super transparent. And now they're my top performing team and they literally run without a manager right now. And they have to wait for me to wake up in Seattle. But it's like, I think we we worked through some of that growth and they always say the only thing constant is change. Um, and you learn a lot and you grow a lot through that. But um, it's taught me a lot that you can assume you've got to ask questions. And as a leader, you have to like lead with the emotion um, and then, you know, go to the revenue after that. Yeah. To get a little bit specific or maybe too tactical, this is just how my brain works. Like how often were you meeting with them or how were you interfacing with them? Was it collectively as a team? Was it in a bunch of one-on-ones or like, how did you begin to like build rapport and then also build some type of program that helped them perform better? Yeah. So the first thing I did is I just like, I always over tilt on time because I think when people don't know, like if they're feeling lost and they don't know what to do, especially young sellers, they want guidance and they want like a game plan and a a plan to figure it out. So at first, my like first three hours of my day, I would like start my day at five and we would just like, I would have three hours with them. It was like undivided attention. And then I go out there now every month and we've just like invested in training and tactics and they were not heard a lot of times, which I think was part of the problem. And so I've been able to solve a lot of their problems, which has gained trust now because they'll, they'll come to me. So I think you've got to dive head first into any problem. And a lot of that comes with time, even though it's not always, you know, the easiest or the funnest, um, and then create systems and processes from there that kind of help set everyone else up. Yeah. I think, um, something that stands out to me about that is we had a customer, there was a study one time that was like, which comes first, a winning culture or, and then performance will follow or teams that are hitting the numbers. They have a great culture because you think it'd be that, right. You think it'd be like, I'm hitting all my numbers and that's what leads to a great culture because we're getting paid, we're making money, but it was actually, you know, a study commission that found the opposite that, you know, teams and revenue teams with great culture where their team defined it, that's what allowed them to start to perform. And it kind of sounds like that's what you're describing here is like, Hey, first, let's just fix the like 48 hour lag or first, let's just fix the, like some of the experience that they have as humans and the performance yeah. follow. I yeah. That. I had someone tell me like when I first became a leader, they were like, know your people first, know your revenue second, and then know your process third. And I'm like, it's so true. Like I'm, pretty much do that now in order. And I think it creates such a better culture than if all I do is talk about revenue. Uh, that's great. One thing I would add to that on the new leadership point, um, I, I had a, a leader that when I was at Challenger that came in and he was really savvy because he sort of mapped influence in the business. So I think a lot of times it's like, okay, let me see who the most senior people are. Let me meet them first. And everybody that that reports into them is going to be like, oh yeah, everything's great. It's wonderful. But he was really sharp about being like, who do people go to in this business when they are challenged, when they're frustrated, like who are those people? And often they're on the front line. And then he reached out to everybody that fit that sort of criteria and was like, called us out of the blue, freaked us all out. But he was like, all right, what's the real story here? Like, what are people not telling me that I should know? And right off the bat, I was like, man, this is someone who I can have an honest conversation with who isn't trying to sell me on like some story that I don't buy into. And as a result, I felt like I trusted him right off the bat. I felt like he just had our best interest in mind. So anybody who's coming in as a new leader, like I would encourage you not to look at things from like a hierarchical level, but actually think about like, who are those change agents inside your business that actually have that ears and eyes? Because guess what I did when I got off the phone with him? I I am to everybody on my team. And I was like, this dude's awesome. Right. And that's what you want. And then you'd have to do less legwork to get there. Yes. I think we all um, underestimate the number of secret sidebars that are happening. (laughs) (laughs) A great point, because I remember that too, as I advanced in my career and advanced in leadership, I was like, y'all, I get no tea anymore. I get no hot (laughs) dogs. There is nothing coming in. And it's like, you have to, you know, because people do want to, you know, it is the front lines, they experience it together at some, at some point, they're not wrong that like 
the other person doesn't understand or couldn't get it. So you have to find a way to connect, not just, you know, um, the people that directly report to you. Yeah. I, our CEO is great about it. I think he calls them skip level meetings. Um, but every single person has like one-to-one communication, making it a point to get the real, the real dish to your point. Um, disruption. Okay. So how can this be a lever or a jumping off point, um, to actually help transform culture for the better? Because I think everyone has experienced this catalyst. And if you're looking to reset your culture on your team or your org, this is a great, uh, you know, tipping off point to say, Hey, we're all experiencing disruption. Let's take this time to reset. So I'd love to hear um, some experiences here. Yeah. So I'll speak both from my own personal experience. And then in my role, a lot of my clients, um, I had the Midwest for a really long time. A lot of my clients were like manufacturing companies that were switching their business models to like AI or services or recurring revenue. And so I watched as a bystander, as a lot of them struggled to make that shift. Um, there's one really important tenet here to me. And this is something I learned from one of my clients years ago. And the way she talked about it was in order to create a culture of winning, when you're going through disruption, you first have to create a culture of losing. Um, And so specifically what she did is saying like, when you're going through change and selling something different or doing something different, your, your priority number one is to get people to try. It's not to get people to win at it or be good at it. It's just to get them to try. And so the way that she handled it, she was a sales manager over a pretty large team of sellers. Um, Once a month, they had a loss for them and they rotated it. So it wasn't always the same person. And they had to come every month with three stories of when they tried to sell this new offering and lost what they learned. And then they talked about it as a team. And I think it's it's more common now than when I first heard of it, but I think it's one of those things when we get busy or there's lots of change, it's like one of those meetings we like start canceling and start not prioritizing when in reality, I think it's like the number one thing because when you create this environment where it's okay to lose as long as you try and you learn from it, I think people lean in way more to trying it. And it goes back to that graph you talked about, right? It's like, I'm scared. I'm scared to do something new and suck at it. At, yeah. at Challenger, we were shifting from a completely professional services model to incorporating SaaS products. I never sold a SaaS product. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. But if I'm able to have that conversation openly, I'm able to learn from other people who've done it in their mistakes. It creates a safer place for me to try and, and keep learning. So if anybody's a manager or anybody is, you know, has a great relationship with their manager, things like that are so simple to set up. And as long as you frame them in a really safe way where we're not going to come on and be like, you should have done this, but it's like, wow, I'm so excited that we learned that. And now we can all avoid that mistake. I think that's a really powerful way to lead when there's all this uncertainty. I think that's also so smart for cross-functional feedback, because if marketing goes and it's like, how's the new pitch working or how's the new deck? People are like, it's fine because they really don't care to have the conversation. If they don't think it's good, they're going to do the thing they want to do anyway. Kind of, you know, so it, it kind of is a forum to be like, it's actually not fine. Here's all the 12 ways it's not fine. And can you help me make it better? Or actually it's going better than we thought it would. Like I tried it thought it would be terrible, but you know, it actually is working. We do something, um, for sales development called call camp. And, um, every Friday, the whole team comes to call camp and there's a different theme. And sometimes it is like, Hey, everyone bring your best call where you handled, uh, you know, bad timing objection. And sometimes it's like, everyone bring your worst call where you totally, fumbled the bag on pricing or whatever it is, you know, and everyone brings like their worst call where they were terrible and they all vote on who was the worst. And it's like, to your point, a celebration of like understanding um, it's okay to fail if you're trying the process that we believe and we are bought into. And it also exposes moments to coach of like, Hey, this is actually a coaching moment note to sell for the manager for later versus this is a bigger business problem or a messaging or a positioning problem or an enablement uh, could really, everyone's failing. So like this could really use some enablement here or something like that. Um, Shay, I'm curious if you have any, I'm sure you have experience with some of this too. Yeah, no, it, it definitely, I, I would say like, a, we've had some things that like as a company we've rolled out, but no one asked for feedback. And so they just, failed, like, a you know, multiple different things I can think of. And it's, then we have to like go back to the drawing board and you have to like, you lose so much momentum. And so by creating those like safe 
um, safe spots. We had to do um, a select group of females within our organization had to present to the C-suite, like big problems that they saw within our org and like how we would actually change those and like what those would look like. Um, and it was cool to be able to like remove yourself from like the day to day and like be like, oh, if I was in charge, how would I actually solve this? And what would this look like? Because they certainly don't get the feedback that they need at that level. Because to your point earlier, Mary, like I don't get the hot tea anymore. I wish I did. And I try with my like skip levels on Friday, but I can't get everything out of them. And so I think creating ways to do that is, is so important. Yeah, I agree. Um, moving on, here is like an actual kind of a little bit of like a format or like a framework. Um, you know, this came from Forrester talking about how revenue leaders specifically can play a role. Um, and it's called the purpose process from definition to measurement. And it talks about how you can define these like mission, vision, values, um, and then you have to move into articulate them. So it's not enough to just kind of put them on a slide and never talk about them. It's kind of what we talked about earlier of like articulate and then activate and then extend. Um, and Jen, you kind of referenced this a little bit with some of the changes that like fell flat a little bit at first, you know, and it was because of this, but I'm curious to kind of hear y'all's take on this framework for how you can actually um, implement some of this stuff. Yeah. First thing I'll say is like, let this be a rallying call for like, stop with the boring mission statement. <laughs> <Value> <laughs> statements. Like if you have cool ones for people that are joining us, put them in the chat. Cause I think it's good for people to hear ones that actually mean something instead of like, we're service oriented. Um, <laughs> so that is my rallying cry. I love this framework. This is, I was really keen on this when, when you shared it, because in particular, articulate internally, externally, locally. I think that's a step that often gets skipped. So I was, I was telling you this story about, I was working with this client, um, classic Midwest manufacturer. They actually got into AI and services and SaaS, and they had articulated this really good internal story as to why they were doing it. Right. And it was like, you know, we've grown as much as we can in this category. We're the market leader. We're 80% market share. We're not gonna be able to sell enough of our physical product to hit the growth goals that we want. So we're shifting to this and people would sit there and they'd nod their heads. Right. And then when they got out to the market, they would, they weren't able to tell that story. Cause that's like completely <laughs> selfish. What do they care about how their company, like this company is growing itself. And so what happened is they would just go back to product led descriptions of what they were selling. And the interesting thing without like exposing who they are and what they sell, the issue was they're selling to these like, you know, very local businesses who are not tech savvy. And so they'd walk in and they'd be like, look at all this cool tech we're doing. And the, the customer would look at them and be like, I, I don't even know how to use my iPhone and text my kids. Right. And so it was like this massive disconnect. The sellers couldn't rely on the internal story and so what did they do? They just stopped pushing it because they were like, it's not landing. And so that's why in this articulate comment, a comment column, I like so much, like there, there absolutely should and can be different internal and external articulations of that, but don't skip that step, particularly on the external explanation, because either one, your sellers don't talk about it or two, they tell the internal story, which doesn't really mean much to the customer. Yeah. I think that's great. I, you know, joked at some point, everyone kept talking about like, our story is not big enough. Our story is not big enough. You know, in marketing, you hear that a lot. I'm like, what even is our story? <laughs> I'm like, how do we make it bigger? I don't even know what it is. Um, so I think that's right. It's like, you've told it to yourself or your team or your um, so many times that you forget that other people haven't heard it. And then you're also used to living in your bubble. Like, I'm at, you know, new year's with my sister and I'm like, and they didn't even put it in Salesforce. And she's like, what's Salesforce? Like literally has no reason. <laughs> and we think of course, like everyone knows what this is. Um, so I think you have to like, remember too, that you are in a bubble and, um, not everyone has, is privy to the information in your mind or, you know, things like that. Um, and Shay, it sounds to me like you love a framework. So I'm curious. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, I think what I see a lot in this too is um, 
bubbles within organizations. So like marketing comes like, or some part of the org comes up with that. This is our story. And, and then they don't even, we don't, that gets to sales or like it gets to a different part of the org and you're like, wait, what? Like, how does this even like, and we're just like, try to run with it. And so then we don't have a story for internal or external. Right. So I think on the collaboration, it's so important to make sure like everyone is, um, it makes sense for everyone and that they all feel good because it gets missed so much because of the, um, I've seen it firsthand. We rolled out a product and it was like one of those, like, oh, we've got this great product. I think like, here's our story, but like, no one actually knew how to tell that story. And the story didn't land in the market at all. And then like six months later, we look up and we're like, why aren't you selling that? And it's like, well, like, here's why no one's selling it is because they don't even know how to sell it, you know? Um, and so I think it's just, yeah, it's, uh, it, and it's hard as a leader because I think a lot of times you sit down and you come up with these great ideas. I know I have done it. And then I'm like, go to my team and I'm like, here's this great idea. And then two months later, I'm like, oh shit, I forgot about that. Like, so you really got to make sure you're on board with it before you do it too. Yes. And tailoring it. So I saw um, my chat is not, I can't chat back to y'all in the chat, but I'm seeing what everyone's putting and I love it. So like Zach said something, you know, like along, along the lines of the story, you do have to tailor it too to the different audiences. Like the story that matters to the board or the VC is not the story that matters to me, frontline seller, or, you know, in different roles. Like you need to think about how you articulate it um, to the person that, you know, you're talking to. Um and what you said, Shay, too, does remind me of that feedback a little bit or a fear of failure of like, you know, some people probably thought it was their fault. Like, am I just bad at selling this thing or is it the messaging or like, where's the forum to have that conversation? And so a common through line that I'm noticing is that if we haven't really used the word transparency, but maybe that's what it is, or like just a platform for more conversation, um, with people outside of just your teammates or your direct manager, it sounds like cross-functional collaboration, like really is a key piece of like a great culture, um, whether it be sales and marketing or product or training or enablement, um, creating places for those conversations for the art articulate step to happen kind of, um, I want to call it just quickly, Zach's, uh, Zachary's comment. You're right. These comments are awesome. I wish we could respond. We can't. The, the, you called out something really cool, Zachary, around potential employees. Like having just gone through being hired, I wasn't thinking about this when we were originally talking about this, but it just sparked an idea. Like I was someone that left a company, told myself I was never going to go back to full time. And here I am, like two weeks later, working at a new full time job. But it was because Will Allred, who was the founder of Lavender, did not give me the VC pitch like you're talking about, Zachary. And like, that's why I want to hit on it for a second. He knew who he was talking to. And he spoke about this value and this vision of like content led growth and hiring led growth. And I was like, oh, that's different. That's unique. Like, I don't hear people talking about that. So it was especially as we think about acquiring talent right now, I think that's the kind of stuff that's going to spark this talent community that is your, your really sharp performers is not just saying the same boring mission value stuff like that, but understanding your audience and being able to articulate like what makes us truly unique. So I just great call out Zachary. Um, this is a little bit of a sidebar and off top, like off kind of out of nowhere. I haven't prepped anyone for this, but <laughs> what I don't hear that much anymore is high. Like remember when people used to hire for culture fit, you know, it was like, <laughs> not a culture fit. Um, and could anyone ever define what that meant <laughs> other than like, you know, I don't, I don't know, but you don't hear about that much anymore because I think there was a stigma around it because I think ultimately what it meant at the end of the day was these people are just like me, um, which is actually, I think people found a terrible way to build a team, yeah. <laughs> like, no um, but I do think there is something that, you know, it's not necessarily culture fit or going back to that, but like you know, can you articulate values or what you want to build and, and find people who also want to build that thing to your point? And maybe that's the new culture fit is like, we have the same vision, like as cheesy as most vision statements are, how do you take that and really be able to articulate it so that people can come on board because they want to do that thing too? You know, um, I think that's interesting. I love Samantha's comment. Hiring or firing for culture is akin to dating for beauty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. Um, yes. Okay. So another one, 
experience, customer experience. Okay. Y'all have probably heard this in your algorithms, but, um, it is, it's one of our values. The customer comes first, um, which honestly quick tangent, the customer comes first is great for me as a demand gen leader, because I do optimize almost all resources toward net new logos. And I do have to sometimes remember like, Hey, marketing has to serve the customer org too. And if we didn't have it declared as like a value, it'd be a lot harder to do, but, um, Shay or Jen, I'm kind of curious on like how you could shift culture based on what you want to do with customer experience in 2023, knowing that a lot of sales teams are going to say, sell where you're already in or expand or grow or take care to retain. So kind of, um, how this might be leveraged. Yeah, I would say we experience this a lot in 2022, and I think it's only going to be continued to be involving in 2023. So um, we have a, a growth and a new logo team. And once someone becomes a customer, we hand them to the growth side. And what that world looked like previously, and I've lived in it, and it was a great one, um, was just organic expansion. You know, ambition buys 10 more seats. We just add that on. It's just, you know, that's the way of the world. And it didn't have to be a proactive approach. It was just kind of a, a reactive world. And, you know, now we've seen this huge shift from the boom that we saw in 2020 of all the tech hires and, you know, people consistently growing to now people reducing headcount and having to consolidate tech stacks and wanting to do more with less. And so we've really had to work on shifting it to, um, you know, do more with the customer. And how do we like actually sell and get the customer to do more within what they're currently have? How do they utilize it more? Um, and not just this reactive approach. And it's definitely been a huge culture shift for us internally because it was so reactive previously, but it, we're learning a ton as we look to like, how do we actually like lead an expansion organization? How do we renew at a higher rate and like have, have really great experience while we do that? So um, it's definitely been a lot of learning um, and, you know, had some ups and some downs, um, like the curve we saw earlier um, along the way, but um, it, it's great. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I think this is, this is the year. I mean, how long have, have, companies like all of ours been talking about, like, you gotta fix the customer experience. You gotta make a good buyer experience. Like this is the year I think we're all having that slap in the face moment where it's, it's no longer this thing. Like if we can, we will, it's like, it has to be a priority. And I think in particular for, um, sales teams, it's like, how do we reduce the effort involved in buying in using our product like effort reduction to me is probably the number one priority because if we consider what's happening to all of these businesses and these customers they're laying people off they're having budgets cut like i hate the term like, doing more with less but it is the reality of what we're in if we are not approaching every customer experience every buying and selling experience with this mindset of like how do i make this job easier for this buyer what can i do so that i can alleviate some of that pain i think a lot of us will see our deals, our customers fall by the wayside because that's going to, I really believe that's going to be a differentiator for companies who get that and understand that the state that all of us are in, I think that's an opportunity. So in every, your company doesn't have to do it. You as an individual control that, right? You can make a decision of how am I going to make this job easier for my, my customer? Yeah, I think that's so smart. And even thinking through it, uh, Nicholas put this in the chat of like creating fans rather than customers mm -hmm. um, with like these wow type of moments. And that's sort of speaks a little bit to your new role at Lavender Gym, but also just like, you know, it used to be like, oh, we need to create a referral program. That used to be the way I need a referral program. And now it is more like, I need to make sure that the experience is so good that the things people are saying about us on social and in communities and like, um, it's not like filling out a form and sending a Starbucks gift card for like your referral anymore. It's about creating an amazing experience that makes customers fans. Like, I love that word. Um, you know, love that. Yeah, that's so true. Cause it's no longer just like get the new business at all costs. It's like, you actually need to like expand and grow more than ever before what your current customer base is. Um, where before it was just like churn and burn in some ways at a lot of organizations. Um, I think, yeah, we've definitely got to get smarter and better with those. Yeah, I agree. Great call outs. Um, and then one thing I do want to ask everyone in the chat, 
Uh, I'm a New Year's resolution person. I know that is very polarizing and some people love them and hate them. <laughs> it's a minority this year, I think. It's all to anti. Each their own. Um, but I would love to ask everyone in the chat and I'm going to ask each of you too, and I'll share mine as well. But Jen, what is one thing that you plan to do to be greater in the new year, whether that be personal, professional for your team, whatever? Yeah, I um, I have two. So I'm going to do, I'm going to cheat a little bit. So one is nothing earth shattering is to say no more to the right things to say no to. I think a lot of people are feeling that this year because there's this building pressure. Um, so it's one is say no more. And then two is do shit that scares me. Like the other day I did my first TikTok and it was so cringy and mortifying, but I was like, I did it and it's done. And now that barrier is over. So I'm really trying to lean into more creative stuff that scares me and intimidates me a little bit more. Cause that's honestly what I admire a lot about a lot of the people that I respect. Uh, that's great. And um, similar to what Samantha put in the chat, find opportunities to feel dumb more. Yes, you know everything. First of all, you probably don't, but also then you are not <laughs> pushing yourself. You know, you need to put yourself in certain scenarios where you don't know it all. So I, I love that a lot. What about you, Shay? Um, yeah. So mine's like a little cheesy, I would say this year, but something that I, I'm trying to be a better, the best version of myself, um, this year. And one of the things that I'm kicking that off with is, um, I'm really bad. I, I wake up in the morning and I get on my phone and I start checking my Slack and I start checking my email and I instantly get stressed and I'm stressed before I'm like even out of bed and it's like five 15 and I'm already like blood pressure up. Um, and so I'm like, not getting on my phone in the morning. I'm allowing myself to like actually get to the office or start my day. Um, and I'm finding so much more peace in it because I'm able to show up better for myself, for my team and my people. Um, and then consistent workout. I'm like one of those per people that go, I do it a lot at a time. And then I'll be like, Oh, I have a work meeting. I can't like, I, I can't find the time to do it. So every day I have like a block and I'm like, sometimes I have to say no to a meeting because I know I need to prioritize this time that I can like take care of myself so I can show up better in other ways in my life. So those are my two, uh, two big ones for the year. Those are great. And I'm loving some of these in the chat. I'll keep putting them in the chat because they are good. Um, doubt myself less is really good. Amanda, I would say mine, I have separate ones for home and work because they need to be, but mine for work is don't take it personal. And it kind of goes back to what we were talking about of like growth and like, it doesn't have to be my idea. It has to be the best idea. I got comfortable with that a while ago um, because that's how you get better. I am pretty comfortable with feedback, but there are certain things when I think that I'm a hundred percent right. And someone else could still come in and say, no, or it's not right. Or have a different opinion. And it feels personal in those instances. So I know that like there's still some work to be done. So for me, I am going to try to um, not take it personal. I think that's how I will learn. I think that's how I will grow. I think it's how I'll feel dumb more in a good way. <laughs> um, and so I'm excited about that. Um, so opening it up, are there any questions? Um, any questions for Jen or Shay about culture frameworks, um, anything that y'all would love to hear more of on webinars, drop them in the chat or the Q and a, um, and we will send out the recording. Everyone will get it. So you can share it with your friends. You can, um, share it on social media. Tell, can you guys actually, that's a great thing. Tell us where to find you online. Is it TikTok? Jen, are we your no. new Driver? Don't find me there. Don't find me. The one and done experience and check the box. Don't look for me. Don't add me. I'm all LinkedIn all day. I love it. Shay, what about you? Oh, well, probably I'm not a big, um, probably LinkedIn would be my biggest one. I just downloaded TikTok for the first time yesterday. So um, I'm not on Jen's level yet, but maybe this year is the year yes, I are. get on TikTok. <laughs> I love it. Um, I live, laugh, love an Instagram moment, but probably y'all don't want to be on there. It's filled with trash. So I'll see y'all on LinkedIn. And I do want to thank everyone for coming today. I hope you come back next time. And thank you. Thank you to our panelists, guests, Jen, Shay, y'all are awesome per usual. And I will see everyone else later. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone.